Hello and welcome to Friday afternoon live stream. It's the last live stream for this year. We all preparing for Christmas. The shop is busy, full of customers buying their gifts. So lots of Z8s were sold, lots of ZFs arrived and were collected. We are very excited. I hope you too, if you haven't bought your present yet, well, there's still time. If you already bought something, do tell us in the comments below what you bought or what you're looking to buy. Uh, do let us know. We have Gray Levitt in the house. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So obviously, Gray is the owner of the shop. It's not like he just traveled here to come here. <laughs> He's here with us all the time. And since Becky is overseas, yes, I thought, why won't me and you yeah. put some jazz music on, pour some whiskey, take some cigars out? and talk about <laughs> photographic retail industry from the beginning of time till the current state. Right, okay. So, well, when you say the beginning of time, I wasn't, <laughs> hard to believe that I wasn't around then, but the beginning of my time, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, so um, when was your first job actually in the camera store? What year was that? Oh, that was in the late 1960s, and um, it was down on the south coast of England um, and, and a place called uh, Bournemouth, mm. and uh, it was a company called Hartle Photographic. Okay. Let me see. I might have a picture of that, actually, Yeah. Uh, conveniently, so let me see if I can work that out. Here we go. Let's see. That might show us a photograph. Uh, there's 30 seconds delay. By the way, if you have a... Photographic related questions to me and to Gray, uh, put QQQ in the chat. You know, we'll be happy to answer them. So who is this man behind the counter? Well, that was my first boss. And um, I lived in s slight terror of him, really, because, um, uh, you know, I went in as a complete neophyte, uh, really, knowing nothing about photography. Mm. Um, although I was taking pictures, really, from my first camera, my parents bought me when I was about nine, um, which was a Brownie 127. Wow, that's nice. And um, he was uh, a real uh, stickler. And um, uh, perhaps you may have heard this uh, before. Some of uh, the older lags uh, would have heard it. But um, every morning he would come into the shop and uh, he would say, Mr. Levitt. Um, and he would come out with some photographic term and he would say, blah, blah, definition. And he'd want to know an answer without any lag. And if you hummed or ahed, or he'd um, send me away to a, a sort of a photographic dictionary or a regular dictionary, and, uh, you know, I would read it and uh, rather smartly remember it, and then I would come up and say, it means so-and-so. And he says, well, what does that mean in application? <laughs> and, and of course, that, and then it all fell down. Because uh, memorizing something uh, doesn't mean you know anything about it. So, um, you know, every day I was always slightly nervous about what was going to come up. Yeah, I can imagine there was no Google, there was no phones, you couldn't just look it up. Um, well, there were phones. Yeah. <laughs> but there were not mobile phones. Uh, this is right, yes. Um, and um, so uh, this went on every day for... I think at least three years until one day he walked in and he said, um, what's the definition of so-and-so? And I told him, he said, well, how does that apply? And I told him and he said, hmm, what about this then? And we went through maybe four or five and he said, okay. He said, you're now competent to work for me, uh, you know, having been there several years. And um, I always really kind of resented it, um, really, and resented him. Mm. And um, and it wasn't till some years later when I went for um, an, another job in the industry in London uh, where they ask you questions and, you know, I could just answer them like that. And I really appreciated what he'd given me because he'd really made me competent in a, in a field that I had not known anything about. And um, so I always thanked him and, um, and I always called him the old commander. <laughs> and um, I, I stayed in touch with him almost up to his passing last year, and um, um, I, I, I think he liked. He, I think he liked. He enjoyed uh, whatever success um, that we've had here. He um, 
he felt a part of it. So it's almost like you had to earn it in oh, order yeah, to do that. Sure, yeah. And you know, like a lot of jobs like this, you have to go through a, like a very long apprenticeship period to learn the craft. Yeah. And only then you would be allowed to do that. Yeah. And nowadays, you just, okay, well, here's the counter, off you, you go. Off you, off you go, <laughs> throw you in the deep end. And, yeah. um, um, it, and of course, nowadays, there's so much more to learn. Yeah. Because I, I mean, how far this shop went back and his, right, one day, uh, he said, well, familiarise yourself when I first started there. And I went through all the drawers and I opened one drawer and they had flash powder in it mm. from the Victorian days, you know, where you would, sprinkle it in the top and there'd be this loud explosion and i asked him why he'd had it and he said well maybe someday someone will walk in and buy it i and, and no one came in while i was there and asked for flash mm. powder so um was it all nikon back in the day already was there nikon yeah uh, i'm sure it was but yes. uh, david asking if what, what models were around that time i, I assume oh, it would be nikon f um yeah then uh, well the nikon f had come out in 59 and um followed by the nickel mat mm. um so those were around as kind of well the nikon f was a flagship professional camera nikon's first of course was it was nikon on your horizon back then were you already starting to think about your first nikon yeah, camera well think think was as close as i ever got really because of the cost um and my first sort of experience with a, with a nikon was this very smartly dressed young chap probably about my age came mm -hmm. in one day and he had a black nikon f mm. with the f36 motor drive gleaming and he handed it over and said put some batteries in this for me and i could tell he was trying to catch me out and um i'd never picked up one before but i fitted the batteries in but it was handling it really that um um made me appreciate uh, the quality of the engineering and how it was put together and it, I thought one day I must get one of these I mean it was so far from my uh, ability to to pay for something like that mm. so my my first single lens reflex was a Practica 4B all right which was you know good for hamming in nails <laughs> <laughs> with a preset lens mm. yeah I'm sure good value right now um, yeah, probably <laughs> yes <laughs> That's true. And how many shops have you worked, photography shops have you worked in? Oh, gosh, I didn't realise we were going to do that. Let me just see. Okay, so Hartles, I went to London. Yeah. And I worked for a place with the unlikely name of Disco Barn. And this was predated disco. It meant disco, mm -hmm. as in discount. So no DJs? No DJs, thankfully. Um, and that was... Um, that was really quite an experience because a lot of the stuff they sold was pretty poor. I think they had a they, they had a sale of eight mil cine cameras once, mm -hmm. and um, this is the days before Super Eight cartridges, where it was real, you know, uh, real to real. You mm -hmm. shot twenty five foot and then you turned it over. And ah, okay. Shot the other side uh, when it was um, when it was all spliced together. And uh, this woman had bought one of these £9.95 cameras and about a week later it wasn't working and she bought it in and, um, and she said, can you repair it? And I said, well, it should work. So I just gave her a brand new one off the mm. shelf and for a bit of fun because I hardly ever saw any customers where the place I was based, it was a fairly, it was like being a lighthouse keeper really mm. but on a street. And um, so I, I took the reels out and I took a screwdriver and I, pulled out the, the metal base okay. that, to reveal the motor, and I turned it upside down to have a look underneath, and it said Pepsi-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> so this was quality, quality engineering. Proper quality stuff, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I went from there um, to London Camera Exchange. Okay. Um, at the head, head office in Winchester, in their so, beautiful square there. So London Camera Exchange, it's uh, had, like existed for quite some time then. Oh yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, I I think he started out of a, a couple of suitcases in a market. All oh, right. And um, built up, you know, the chain store that's we see today. That's um, you know very well respected and very well run. And um, 
and then I moved to Bournemouth um, and um, the manager and I didn't really get on too well mm -hmm. and uh, I think he thought that I would be better off elsewhere. Mm. So I found myself out of work and, um, and I started looking around and I eventually um, I saw an advert for a shop called Leslie Miller Photographic Mm -hmm. which was in Poole in Dorset. And it was a, uh, it was a pro shop mm -hmm. and um, uh, where I first met Robert White, who went on to have, you know, quite a career, um, became an extremely wealthy uh, young man with a, uh, a large collection of the most amazing motorbikes. He had Bruff Superior bikes and he had all sorts of things. He sold quite a lot of them to... Jay Leno, the American. Yeah, I host. I really wish we would have our channel before he oh, passed. Yeah. So because again, he he is a man of a few stories, I would say. Oh, Robert, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, because one day um, he used to deal with these old farmers that we used to get it being down in Dorset, and he got chatting to this old boy who said, "Oh, come down to my place." And they were going through a barn, and he said, "You like motorbikes, don't you?" And he said, "Yeah." And he had a Bruff Superior, and the Bruff Superior motorbike was a, a very famous um, a very famous brand. In fact, Lawrence of, um, T.H. Lawrence of Lawrence of Arabia fame had one. Mm. They are now worth colossal sums of money. <laughs> and these were all brand new parts. And wow. he allowed Robert to buy it in increments. And, and Robert invited me around to his place, and he had it in his kitchen, and he built it through the course of a, a winter. I think he ended up with six or seven of them. Wow. Speaking of uh, what's worth quite a lot of money nowadays, Joe Vlog says, I bought my first Nikonev for one pound at flea market in Bolton <laughs> and sold it for 120. <laughs> well, you could wait, you could hold on to this and it probably would be a lot worth now. Uh, but David is asking, um, how did you choose photography as a career? And should you say why? I think there's two questions. There's because obviously there's a photography retail career mm. and also you did music photography career mm. as well. Yeah. So what was the choice for, bo for both? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I uh, was, um, was very keen on music and, um, you know, particularly rock music and the pro progressive music scene that was just beginning um, to start in the UK. I would listen to a legendary um, disc jockey called John Peel, who started off on Radio London. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was playing the sort of musicians and bands that no one else was touching. He, mm -hmm. yeah, he wasn't playing the top 20. He, mm -hmm. And so he, you know, he was promoting bands like that are now huge. Um, um, our legacy bands like Pink Floyd and Zeppelin and mm -hmm. um, Jefferson Airplane and and people like that. And um, we had a local club in uh, Bournemouth, um, and uh, every Friday night at the Ritz Ballroom in Bournemouth, um, bands would play. Mm -hmm. And um, but it was to about a dozen sort of students. Uh, making half a lager last all night, <laughs> and a, a local band, local blues band, trying to entertain them, and um, I, I realised that this wouldn't last too long financially. So, I I wrote to the uh, owner manager and said, "Look, I love coming, but clearly it's not commercially viable mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. um, ha why don't you? Um, here's a list of people I think you should." book mm -hmm. and um and um i think you should change the name of the night and much to my great surprise he wrote back and said um and we think this is a great idea we're changing the name of the night mm -hmm. and um we're going to book the the first people we've got booked next week is a is a is a bloke called jethro tull <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he thought it was a man rather than mm -hmm. a, a, um, a band and you know, I was used to just sort of walking in and and um, I got there. I barely got through the door and I think they turned away several hundred at the door that night mm -hmm. and they were on their first tour of the UK. And the following week we had Fleetwood Mac. Mm. So A little indie just, band. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then Black Sabbath and mm -hmm. all those sort of bands. 
and I wanted to photograph them. And I thought, I can't really afford the equipment I need to. Maybe I should get a job in retail. Oh, that in a helps. camera shop. Mm. And maybe, maybe, maybe I could get a discount or maybe occasionally I could borrow something. That's how you end up with rooms of full of equipment. Yes. Uh, lots of cameras and lenses. Um, as we always said, we don't work here for money. We work here for equipment. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's interesting, you mentioned the bands that obviously at this stage, obviously, they, they have legacy. I think back in the day, they obviously were still small bands. And oh, yeah, going up and down the motorway and, uh, you know, Bedford vans and uh, all meeting at the Blue Boar Inn on the motorway. Exactly. So, you know, if you are a young, inspiring photographer and, you know, it doesn't matter who you photograph, maybe those people will become famous later on. So, Absolutely. you know, uh, you just have to get the job. Um, but um, I'm just going through the comments and uh, thank you very much, Vince. He's enjoying content. And uh, Ma uh, Michael Reed was asking about music photography back in the 70s. So hopefully that answered your question as well. Uh, another question that uh, Seth asked, and Seth, we promised you to have more Gray on the channel. Oh, Here we go. Seth, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, how Gray feel about legacy methods of young photographers in this era? How do I feel about that? Legacy methods. So I guess. What does that mean? I don't, I don't know, know, Seth. Can you? I wonder if it's just using the old techniques. Uh, Who knows? But maybe old, Seth can. Old, in, old, yeah. Old techniques or old equipment. Could be both. So uh, maybe she's. Well, I film. think. I think. Um, you. You use what works really, and um, because, I you know I've noticed uh, sometimes, um, for example, when. Um, Simon Stafford's done a flash workshop. Mm. I've, you know, I've I've gone along to them, and um, I, I was also surprised where there were a number of, you know, quite well known pros would attend, and and Simon would give a talk, and and one of them would say to me, "I had no idea this flash gun could do this. <laughs> I just put it on and s set it on this." So I I think um, if you got something that works. Um, works for you and, and you're under the gun professionally um, then you're probably likely to use the thing that you 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 learned and, mm -hmm. and it depends how willing you are to try new things mm -hmm. and um, and uh, I, I, I it always fascinates uh, fascinates me well well when Seth and Joe uh, Seth Miranda and Joe McNally were here recently on that fantastic um, um, live stream that you mm -hmm. did with them. Uh, Seth mentioned that whenever a new product came out, even a non-new product, that uh, Joe would ring him up, mm. wanted to know. And I, I think the spirit of inquiry should always be with you. You should always be willing to look at new things and, and, and try them out because you might find something that's better for you. That's true. I'm, I'm reading Ronald. Uh, um, Ronald is in chat. Hi, Ronald. Uh, he's a great customer of us. He's been 18 years since, you know, of Beast and Grace, and, and Tim has always been classy. So um, Ronald is visiting from the United States. Well, anytime you are in London, feel free to pop in. Oh, absolutely. You're very welcome. Uh, he has a question about Nikon Magazine. Yeah. And he asked him, how have you guys maintained Nikon Magazine for so many years while a lot of other magazines closed down? What's the secret? Gosh, well, um, that's another really good. That's another really good question. Um, well, the one thing that we wanted to do when we started is that um, a lot of magazines, when you pick them up, unless there's something like Vanity Fair or Country Life, where they've got a huge market, a huge, um, huge um, income from advertising from these large brands. Um, I, I always found um, a lot of the magazines, you'd have a great photograph, but it was missing being on quality paper. Mm. So we've always strived for something there that would m make the images as good as we could get. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's not been easy, but actually a lot of that it has nothing to do with me. I, you know, I'm very fortunate that... Um, uh, Nikon Owner magazine is is run by um, uh, Gillian Greenwood um, and um, and general manager uh, Katrin Rukart who have done just a fantastic job really and um, 
and and also people who continue to renew and we get new subscribers and um plus it's become a, a a really a vehicle that if you've got some work that you would like to get to a wider audience you know we we welcome your submissions we really do and the magazine does reach some very interesting hands around the world none that i can really uh, talk about here but um you know i know some people have pulled in some terrific jobs as a result of the magazine uh, being seen by um, uh, some people in interesting positions uh, in the film world by that i mean the movie world and um, and places like that and have reached out to take them on uh, board Fantastic. A couple of comments from the chat. Joe Vlog says, uh, Jethro Tool is my favorite band. And uh, uh, Nick Harrison also says that he has been lucky enough to photograph Jethro Tool concerts over the last decade or so. Yeah. Great band. Yeah. And of course, they've got a, I think they've had a very large anniversary recently. A lot mm. of these are 50 year old bands now. That's true. Mm. That's true. Um, how did the whole idea of Grace start it? So you've been working in camera stores for quite a while. Yeah. You've been doing music photography. Mm -hmm. How do you come up with the idea of your own shop selling photographic equipment? Well, I'd need to go back a bit. Yeah. Because I was, um, where was I? I was, I had been working at a company called Fox Talbot. Yes. Um, uh, Fox Talbot was a, a shop um, owned and created by a gentleman called John Britton and um, uh, it was set in the um, in Tottenham Court Road he mm -hmm. also owned a, a chain of um, of camera uh, stores called Techno um, Techno sold out to uh, Car Farm Warehouse mm -hmm. and um, uh, Fox Talbot's was taken over by by Jessup but uh, I I was working for him and uh, was married um and um had decided that i wanted a break and uh, oh, and i moved to scotland with my 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 late wife mally and um and we were living up there and um for a few years mm -hmm. unfortunately she got um very ill with cancer mm -hmm. and so i had to move back um to uh, to london and, uh, and sadly, she uh, she passed away. And some very close friends of mine invited me to um, stay with them in the United States, mm -hmm. Los Angeles. And uh, I was over there for two or three weeks. And it seemed uh, I had some office mm -hmm. while I was over there. So um, I um, I decided that I would move there. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I was... I'd, when I came down to London, I started working for a company called KJP, mm -hmm. Keith Johnson Photographic, which were eventually sold to Calumet, mm -hmm. which was then sold to Wex. Wex. Yeah, that's right. And all that. Well, all that. And so um, I was in the States for late 70s, 79 ish to about 84, 85. Mm -hmm. And um, I was doing photography. Uh, I was writing um, for various magazines. Um, I wrote a column for a science fiction, science fact magazine. I can see you were moving tripods as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that was KJP. That was in the, <laughs> the tripod forest. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I also got approached by Kate Bush to mm. write for her magazine. I'd known her for many uh, years since really before she'd even released her first single. Yeah, some of you might know her from Stranger Things single, Rain Up The Hill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably yeah. if you're 10 years old, but the rest of us <laughs> well, yeah. known her for quite a while before yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so uh, I did that, I enjoyed it very much. Um, I mean, it would probably take up a whole nother show. So, but um, I, we can talk about that at some other time. Yeah, I um, want to know some stories. Yeah. You know, from some of those stories that will happen in the shops. You oh, know, though, the yeah. ones that you're not allowed to talk about on there. But since it's our last live stream yeah. this year. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So what I'll do is, I'll just to answer that question, yes. is that um, my 
uh, my sister, um, Susie, uh, dropped me a line and said, we haven't seen you, why don't you come over for the summer? Mm -hmm. And it appealed to me. And uh, so I came over and I got approached to, um, to work for an indie record label and doing their promotions. Okay. And um, so we had um, we had the indie record label. Uh, we had a, a keyboard hire company. So it was synths were the big things in the eighties. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and we had a couple of recording studios where a lot of people would come in and do demos. Mm -hmm. And um, um, while I was there, I ended up um, managing uh, some musicians, mm -hmm. um, including. Um, the uh, Nicky Hopkins, the late great Nicky Hopkins, um, my dear wow. friend, and um, Nicky was a, a session musician, and um, he had played on over two hundred and fifty albums um, during his career. So um, he did all the lazy, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, the Kinks. Bowie, Bolan, the Beach Boys, Ella Fitzgerald. It, wow. Uh, he was a remarkable, a remarkable, remarkable talent. And um, so, um, and, and in fact, quite recently, um, I was invited to be part of a documentary on his life called The Session Man, uh, which opened the Dock and Roll Festival in London um, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and... The other thing that Nicky and I had in common, um, apart from his uh, great love of old English radio mm -hmm. comedy, uh, was he was a very keen photographer. Oh, okay. Um, and um, so uh, I had this this idea. Well, maybe um, maybe I should do something back in retail. Mm. Um, but I didn't have any money mm -hmm. um, for a stock. Um, I couldn't have afforded any premises, certainly not a place like this. And um, so my my sister Susie offered me a room in her kitchen. <laughs> okay. Or next to her kitchen. And um, so I had an old, um, uh, a couple of old filing cabinets. Mm -hmm. And I put a door on top, stuck a phone on it, and um, started there. But no one would give me credit. So I couldn't get a MasterCard, which was access in those days. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get Visa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll, I don't know a single photographic dealer that would willingly take on Amex because they, their their charges are very high, mm -hmm. which eats into any margin that you mm -hmm. make significantly. So I thought, well, maybe they might be more open. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have Amex back in the day because I was one year old, but. Uh... <laughs> 20 years later, here I am. <laughs> right. But it's interesting because you, you, you mentioned Amex. It's not the first company you would go to, isn't it, for, for, a, for a line of credit? What, what, who were you thinking of then? Well, normally you would go like Visa Moscow, oh, no, right? So yeah. Oh, okay. okay. They, they turned me down. Well, that's interesting. See. Okay. And so I thought, well, I'll ring up Amex, mm -hmm. which I did. And, um, but just to give you some background, my mm -hmm. sister's... Um, uh, place she'd only moved into a, a short way with her, um, uh, her future husband mm -hmm. and um, so they were still working so it was concrete floor and um, they temporarily put their bedroom in the, the first room that you mm -hmm. come into mm -hmm. and um, so when I rang up America's I said can you send me the forms and much to my dismay they said, well, the senior area manager is in London today and she'd like to pop around and meet you. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, my God. So as it was a building site, uh, you know, I got some ladders together and put pots of paint and mm -hmm. building materials around to make it uh, look more authentic. Um, and I threw a tarpaulin over uh, my sister's double bed and... Um, they had a number of cats um, for some uh, for some reason, who always liked to invite their local friends in. So I shooed them out and I closed the cat flap to keep them out. And she came down. And I was sat in the chair and I was talking her through with a great deal of of um, 
intention really and um and hope mostly and prayer and suddenly i looked up and out of the corner of my eye i see part of the tarpaulin move and i realized a cat had got trapped underneath the tarpaulin mm. and i'm i was thinking please just settle down please just settle down and then to my horror i saw a second movement and then they started to fight or play and they rocketed out through the door, smashed through the cat flap. And as they rocketed out, the other seven or eight came charging in. And the lady for Namax just burst, <laughs> burst into laughter. Mm. And, and she, I mean, she said, oh, this has one of, been one of the most enjoyable experiences I've had in a long time. And she said, listen, she said, I th she said, I think you've gone to a great deal of trouble to stage this. And she mm. said, uh, I like your idea, she said, and, but I, 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 like the, um, I like the creativity. I'm going to give you an account. <laughs> she says, don't, she says uh, don't make me look silly mm. and uh, don't let, make me regret it. So um, once we got that, I then got diners mm. and rang up visa and said i don't understand why i've been turned down i've got this and they said oh could you give us your mm. Amex number and we got them all you know so um what did you start to trade with what equipment did you sell oh everything yeah every every brand that we can so we did you know minolta mamiya pentax mm. on. all the good ones all the good ones and um 645 veronica mm. mamiya um, What's a, did Bronica Zenza had Nikon lenses on it? Uh, that you're thinking of the very early Bronicas. Okay. Yeah, the big clunky old things. Mm. Um, they were Nikkor lenses. I see. Um, by the time you get to the 80s, Bronica had um, done a whole new thing. They had mm. their own Zenzanon lenses. Mm. So we had the ETRSI, mm. which was 6 by 4 five. I've got that one. Yeah. It's nice. And then the SQ uh ai um which was six per six and mm -hmm. i think the g i think it was the gs1 which was six per seven um and then rb67s hasselblads um and and things like that so we did a bit of everything mm -hmm. and what was your decision to become exclusively nikon um well i regularly bought the amateur photographer, which mm -hmm. I've been buying since I was about 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very thick magazine in those days because that was the the sort of source of buying secondhand equipment. Loads and loads and loads of dealers. And, um, you know, I could afford adverts in the classified that were this big. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized we, you know, we didn't have the equipment the range of equipment we didn't have the money for stock we didn't have the money for advertising and there was nothing really to um make us stand out in any way significant you know why I, and i wondered well would i go to me if i was looking mm -hmm. for equipment and i didn't see anything that gave me any confidence and it was one day i was walking through the docklands as it was being developed and uh, it was a very hot day and i popped into this warehouse which had shops and coffee bars and so forth and i stopped for a cold drink and um all the shops were largely empty mm. girls filing their nails now they'd be on a mobile phone mm -hmm. and i noticed at the back there was a shop which people were coming in and out of and it looked really busy and intrigued i went along and much to my surprise, it was called the Christmas shop. In on a hot July day, mm -hmm. they were selling Christmas things. Okay, Christmas ornaments for trees. And I went in and asked to speak to the manager, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, he came out and he said, "Is there a problem?" And I said, "Well, clearly not for you. Please tell me <laughs> about this stuff." And he said, "This happens all the time. Tourists come in and go." Oh my God, a cool. And they're intrigued enough to come in and then they'll see things that want to buy. Mm. He said, occasionally, like at Easter, we'll do some mm -hmm. Easter themes. And I said, how extraordinary. And it was an American idea. And as I walked back along the River Thames, I, um, I thought to myself, maybe we should just specialize. 
and there were speciality Leica shops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And um, um, but to my certain knowledge, there wasn't a specialist in Nikon, mm -hmm. which I knew more about than probably any other brand mm -hmm. apart from Hasselblad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought had one of those sort of road to Damascus moments where I thought, well, let's why don't we try why don't we try Nikon only and um, so that that was the plan really but then we were sort of forced to look for premises mm -hmm. and um, I found this in a side street in Pimlico uh, a, a long abandoned former hairdressers called White Sparbers mm -hmm. and um, I've got just the right picture of that well, from 1940s, but yeah, it's a bit earlier, but yeah, and um, it was in not in great condition, mm -hmm. and um, there was hair and, and if you want to stuff sofas with something, there was plenty of hair in there. Yeah, that's right. Yes, <laughs> that's right. There was, and um, in fact, I went over uh, to look at it with my first customer, uh, Derek mm -hmm. Cook, mm -hmm. who I maybe mentioned a few times on these broadcasts and Derek was a Metropolitan Police scenes of crime photographer mm -hmm. who was a, a keen book buyer and uh, I said to him I wanted to get his opinion mm -hmm. and so I said can you come over and have a look at this uh, have a look at this shop mm -hmm. and these premises and he looked at it in all the state and he, he looked around he looked at me and said are you sure <laughs> and um um so um, uh, that was it, really. We, mm. we, we took on um, uh, that, and um, I approached the um, MD of Nikon. It was uh, the late Harry Collins, mm -hmm. who had started Nikon UK. Mm. Um, he'd used to, he used to work for Rank Audiovisual. Okay. And Rank had all the big um, dealerships, you know. So they had Pentax, they had Bamiya, they had Minolta, mm -hmm. I think. And a lot of others, and he had this idea of of just dealing with Nikon, mm -hmm. maybe setting up dealers that were authorized to sell it. Mm -hmm. And he went to his bosses, and they said, "Okay, we'll give you a rep on the road. We'll give you a secretary, two desks, two phones, and you've got a year. If you don't make it after a year, you can't come back to your old job." And um, so I went to see him with this idea. And he, and he said to me some years later, he said, you know, when you came to me with that idea, he said, you reminded me so much of myself mm -hmm. when I tried to do Nikon, uh, you know, Nikon and started Nikon UK and and uh, you started the Nikon only. So um, I was very grateful to um, Harry Collins for um, sort of helping me along and, and um, giving me the support that I, I you know, that I needed really. Mm hmm I'm just going through the chat and first of all, thank you, Jean. She says good morning uh, to me and you, Gray. And then there's uh, there's lots of love to old photographic retail. So uh, we've got uh, Stephen Knox says, I've just found my sales invoice from Fox Talbot for my 135 2.8 lens dated 13th of August, 7, 1974. It, the cost was 94 pounds and 50, 50 pence. Yeah. Uh, then we had, who, who did we have here? So we had, Dave Walker says, I bought my Pentax LS and several lenses from Tecna in the early 80s. Then uh, we have OC2 Fish 07. I bought my Nikon F801S from Tecna in Houston Road. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's lots of camera shops were around Houston Road, Totem Court Road. Yeah. Um, I think like even Calumet before they closed down because I think they were redeveloping the train station, but uh, they used yeah. to be there till... Just close to Houston. Yeah, yeah. I think mid-2000s or something like 2008, yeah. 2009, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, because their MD invited me over one day to have lunch with her and, you know, showed me around the building and uh, and told me that what was going to happen to them, the whole area was being redeveloped. In fact, um, by Techno was the original... Um, uh, place for Capital Radio. Okay. And that's all gone now because that was on that road. I think it was the Marylebone Road. There, oh, there I see. On. Okay. Yeah. So, the, and there were a lot of camera shops in Tottenham Court Road. Yes. Yeah. I mean, when my time was back in 2008, I mean, Jacobs used to be there. Um, the original Jessops yeah. that was on owned by corporations or something, you know. So mm. they were there, obviously, they closed down. Mm. 
there was something like Micro Center, obviously original Calumet, which is now Wax. Yeah. I used to go to Calumet at Water Street, actually, to post my films back Did in the you? day. Yeah, they, yeah, they had a little shop in there. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned there were labs everywhere back in the day. There, there were some yeah. that were open 24 hours, isn't it? That's right. Well, Joe's Basement um, and um, Gypsy Joe ran it. And uh, so it was open 24 hours a day. There was another one in Wardour Street. And I, I, you could go in there at 12 o'clock. One o'clock in the morning, pick up your films, and if you were shooting on transparency, they had a load of light boxes with loops, so you, mm. could, you could go through everything and then discuss printing. And it was a hive of activity because, you know, in Water Street, was, all the music yeah, industry, isn't it? Yeah, you know, the Marquee Club, and um, you know, you're in Soho area, so you got Ronnie Scott's. Yeah, you, you and me should do a walk at some we point. Should. I think once it gets warmer, we should yeah. definitely do that. We'll we'll do we'll um, we'll do a walk together. But you know, it, uh, retail's an uh, an odd world, and we've had we've had you know, I, I was thinking of bringing out a, a little um, book called "A Funny Thing Happened on My Way to <laughs> the Shop." You should write that. Yeah, I, I remember one day I uh, you know fairly early on. I was looking after someone in the shop and um, one of the other chaps that was working for me was serving someone and, and a chap came in and, you know, I always make a point of saying, you know, we'll get to you as soon as we can if you're not in a terrible hurry. He said, no, 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 I'll, I'll have a browse. You take your time. I've no hurry. So probably about he was looking for all the cabinets and um, when I'd finished with this particular customer... And seen him on his way. I said, how, how can I help you? And he says, um, have you got a nymph? <laughs> I said, sorry? He said, have you got a nymph? He said, I said, I have no idea what you mean. He said, you've heard of a nymph, surely? And I said, do you mean those rather sort of attractive maidens that uh, inhabit, you know, rivers and the sea to lure? From the myth, from the Greek myth, from yeah. The Greek myths. Mm -hmm. I said, but they might inhabit the sea and, and rivers, but not as I fire a camera shop. He said, what are you talking about? He said, I'm one a nymph for fly fishing. And I said, well, we sell cameras. And he said, you know, I wondered what all these cameras were doing in a fishing tackle shop. <laughs> you know, sometimes I, I dread, what if I was... Um, you know, being accused incorrectly and wrongly of murder and they were on the jury, mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't stand much of a chance, would you? No. Because they're obviously sort of cut off from the fruits of observation. But, it, <laughs> you know, it does, uh, it, it was, you know, you could look at it in a light-hearted way, but mm -hmm. we do get those sometimes bizarre, uh, b bizarre experiences, really. Yes, and some of them we can't talk about <laughs> on air. <laughs> um, but again, yeah, R.G. Lewis being mentioned in Tony McCordero, Kingsley Photographic. I remember Kingsley Photographic. Yeah, yeah they me were, too. They were, they were opposite Fox Talbot. That's right. So quite a few places back in the day. But let's come back to Grace. And you start to sell Nikon. Um, what was kind of one of the biggest releases for Nikon back in the day? So let's say pre-digital. What, what would be the best-selling camera? Oh, um, well, the F4. F4? Yeah. Was it because it had autofocus? It was first professional camera with autofocus, yeah, obviously. Well, yeah, yeah. It um, it was it was autofocus, interchangeable heads, yep. um, and you could change the designation mm -hmm. of it by changing the battery pack. That's right. So you had F four F four S and F four E. Yeah, and um, it um, you know had the usual uh, you know spot center weighted and um, and matrix metering decent motor drive and uh, well, we did really rather well with it. It's interesting. So the, I think the first Nikon Autofocus camera, if I'm not mistaken, was either F501 or F801. And then the F4 was the first professional one. Mm. And what was what would people ask at the time? Because obviously we had F3, which was mm. the flagship manual focus camera. And then F4 came out. And obviously the design is very different from yeah. the traditional Nikon film cameras. And it had a focus. So for professional photography, I can see it would make a lot of difference. What yeah. kind of questions were you asked by customers? Well, um, yeah, I mean, they did tip their toe in the water because they did make an F3 AF. That's right, with the three lenses. Three yeah. lenses and a huge DX1 head. 
mm -hmm. and uh, with a very, very slow focusing. And they were really, really slow focusing. Very, yeah. very slow. Yeah. Um, lenses were... Yeah, that's true. I think we, I think we have one downstairs, have yeah. Mm -hmm, 200 yeah. mil. Um, yes, well, the sort of... It's, it's interesting. I, I've always noticed over the years, it's less so now, but it used to be once upon a time, when the F gave way to the F2, mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, instead of a back that came all the way off, it had a hinged back and it had rounded corners. Mm -hmm. There was a sort of... Certain of the pros at the time thought it was a bit feminine. <laughs> I guess it's the times, yeah. Yeah, uh, it was a bit, um, and it was a bit like um, when the F3 came out, why on earth would you want aperture priority? You know, isn't, isn't that a bit unprofessional? Wow. You see. And, and now we have pre-capture pre and all that. So you, uh, it's uh, even records the image before you've taken it. Yeah, yeah. I think what it is is that... Um, you know, if you, you know, like Seth was talking about earlier, uh, you know, about legacy photography, mm. I think if you learned in a certain way, maybe depending on your age and your, your experience, you're maybe less reluctant to try new things. Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, you need to be challenged early enough in time to understand them. And, and is it valuable to you? I mean, I've got a remote control for my TV. It's got buttons on. I haven't a clue. Mm -hmm. What half of them do? I know what works. No, me neither, actually. <laughs> and that's Mr. Techie. <laughs> as long as I can get YouTube, Netflix, you know, <laughs> and PlayStation. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, they they wanted to know. Well, could you know? Could they fix their manual lenses on it? Mm -hmm. You know, what was the point of autofocus when they could focus quite well enough by hand? After a while, when they get used to it and they see the advantages of autofocus, um, and um, you know, and it was really when we got to lenses like the AFS, where the speed built-in motor, built, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. the, uh, caught up. There was, um, I think, Canon were quite a way ahead of them at the time. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, who's Canon? Never heard of them. No, have you not? No, no. yeah. Is it the Prince Company? That's the ones, yes, the one. yeah. <laughs> Five seconds of humor on this channel. Uh, but it's interesting because the reason why I'm talking about this is because this conversation comes up all the time. Something new comes out, which mm. is groundbreaking. Mm. And this whole conversation starts over and over yeah. again. I want to talk to you about Nikon D1. So the first digital camera, yeah. people are still using film. Mm. D1 came out, I think, in 1999. It was $5,000. I don't know what it was at the time in the UK, probably what, half, two and a half thousand pounds? I think so? it was, yeah. So was it, um, people start to look into digital cameras and they yeah. have a fives at the time, you know, F100. Again, what kind of questions did they have? Oh, um, it, was the, it was the memory cards and the storage devices. How would they, how do they know, how would they know it would last? Mm. Um, you know, if you've got a negative somewhere, I mean, look at this. This, this is ours, and it's an unused D1, and it was gifted to me by a, a gentleman called um, Anthony Swift, and, and uh, who very kindly um, gave it to me. And I said, because um, it's still got its box, that I wouldn't sell it, so we have it on display. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it, fe it felt like a Nikon mm -hmm. because it's very, very well made. It's actually quite heavy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, uh, but they wanted to know the costs of the memory cards. Uh, they were expensive. Yes, those uh, one gigabyte card, or even less than 512 megabytes. And mm -hmm. that would probably cost something like 150, 200 yes, pounds right. back in the day. Yeah. And also, do I need, do I need a computer? Why do I have to have a computer? How much is a computer going to cost? Do I have to have a printer? So there was a whole, you couldn't just buy the camera. You had to think the whole thing through and, uh, and consider what sort of investment you were willing to, um, uh, to do. And that's for a 2.7 megapixel resolution as well, which nowadays we have 45 megapixels. And obviously yes. some cameras can go to 150 megapixels. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to me that it, 
it took them about some, I'm looking at about five years to go from $5,000 cameras. And then in 2004, they released the D70, mm. which was under 1,000 pounds. So in 2002, they released D100 for 2000, and then yeah. 2004, D70. So 2004 probably would be the first time where they actually had a consumer type camera. Still, $999 is not for everyone. No, but we did sell a lot. It was very, very welcomed. What's interesting to me, when you, you mentioned that it felt like a Nikon camera, mm. remember when they released mirrorless cameras? Mm. You know, first Nikon Z6, Z7 came out. Mm. And I think one of the things what people said when they tried them first, obviously they were smaller and lighter, mm. but overall they felt like a Nikon camera. Yeah. And I think that's something that Nikon did really right to make sure that the, the feel of the camera stays the same regardless if you're using a film camera, a DSLR or mirrorless camera. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and of course, a lot of the uh, people that have worked for Nikon, particularly in their design area, mm -hmm. like uh, the, the great um, Goto-san, Tetsuro Goto, who worked on all their cameras from, I think, the F3 mm -hmm. on up to and including the DF. And they do tend to follow the successful actions mm -hmm. of previous uh, people. And uh, I think it was important that uh, that their Z series or Z series, as you call it in the States, um, has that familiar Nikon build quality that gives you confidence that you've got something that will um, will last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tadish says that the first memory cards were real hard drives with spinning plates inside yes, them. That's right, absolutely. That that's just sounds crazy to me because we're obviously on solid state now and yeah. it's all can be very tiny. You can have several terabytes on that little bit yeah. of square. Hmm. Um, what do you think, what, what, what camera do you think was the most significant uh, release in Nikon uh, DSLR lineup? Was it uh, them going full frame for the first time? Mm -hmm. Is that what you think? Yeah. Definitely, it was it was something that everyone was going for because there was still still this consideration very early on that um, digital could never be as good as mm. as a high quality uh, transparency. That's true. Until it surpassed it. Yeah, I disagree with that, but you know, I'm biased. Yeah, well, you, you know, <laughs> film forever. You, uh, you, I, you, I agree. I, li that. I like film too. Yeah. Yeah, if it wasn't so um, damn costly. That's right. Still, new film is coming out, which is really nice. Yes, Harman is out. Yeah, but you, I agree with you. D three obviously came out. It was you know big chunky, just like D one. Obviously, was perfect for professional photographers. But then they released D seven hundred almost at the same time, mm. which was almost size of F one hundred or D two hundred, D three hundred body with a full frame. And I think for me that was the first camera when I tried it. I think I had D three hundred back in the day, and I think you did. Yeah. yeah, we had a loan from Nikon. I remember I took it to China mm. for three weeks. I came back mm. and I just said, Craig, can I buy D700? Mm. And it stays with me for five, six years at least. Yeah, great camera. Real workhorse. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Surprisingly, people are still shooting with D700. And like um, we got David Cruz. I'm not sure if he's in chat today, but uh, he's using D700 now. He's in Los Angeles photographing weddings. Mm. And because of the color reproduction, and just the kind of performance that the sensor gives to the image, you is, know. Is he the wedding photographer? Yes, yes. Yeah, the drunken. Yes, that's the, him. The drunken yeah. wedding photographer. Yeah. yeah. That's the name of his. Uh, that's his, right. His company, rather than <laughs> me being rude about it. Well, when you hire a photographer for a wedding, you know what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> But it's interesting, I'm just looking at the chart again. And yeah, people say 120, uh, 28 megabyte compact flash card uh, was uh, someone's first credit card, uh, memory card, 85 pounds back in the day. I think we had the Nikon memory card under our glass table at some point. I think it was 32 megabytes. Mm. Now we have one terabyte memory cards. Yeah. That's just incredible. Mm. What, was your what was your highlight of this year, Greg? Oh, well, there have been a few actually. Um, well, one was in was in February, which mm -hmm. was um, winning the um, amateur photographer um, uh, platinum mm -hmm. good service award for the seventh year in a row. Mm -hmm. um, Let me see if I've got one here. And, I think um, I do. It's um, it's uh, it's something that um, 
we know we strive to uh, to win every, every year and uh, through the good graces of our customers who are happy with our service we we've, we've uh, been uh, voted for and actually um just this week um a few days ago in fact we were voted retailer of the year by the british photographic industry news um other things um, is that fifth year in a row what is that fifth year in a row in the a bbi row? award it's no what was it i was just trying to think um i've forgotten i'll have to have a look let's have but a look. um it is the fifth year in a row yes yeah it was was it okay good um so that was that um we had a we had a visit from um the um the actor the american actor michael, michael roberts michael d roberts um uh who's a wonderful wonderful man and um uh, he his sort of films and uh, television credits are, are just absolutely huge he was originally in um one of the films he was in rain man mm -hmm. uh, with dustin hoffman and tom cruise and um i guess a, a more recent one was um star is born with uh, lady gaga lady gaga and bradley cooper mm -hmm. and um i'd met him a few years ago in america and we got on very well i saw him in the states when i was over there in october and he said he was coming to britain so he came and spent a day with us didn't he great chap wonderful yeah, yeah wonderful um uh, man and uh we're we've got a surprise coming from him in a in the new year oh, i'm uh, looking forward we'll, to uh, that we'll we'll tell you uh, all about and um so i had a an, a, a very nice uh, very nice time um other other highlights well i guess we've had a couple of um camera releases yeah camera releases, and you can say that you can yeah, say that yeah. small little cameras yeah, that that's sold right. millions yes. um <laughs> well zf is zf is flying on the shelves that F is still back ordered so um yeah. yeah um but the good news is we are getting those in uh yeah i i find that nick and def uh, nick and definitely did a good job with z8 early in the year yeah so we had the camera that's not as big as that nine doesn't cost as much but right. does a lot of things as that nine does and obviously then nikon zf a retro camera so brings a lot of nostalgia brings a lot of excitement just about just holding the camera but also taking it out and doing some photography but the technology it packed as well absolutely absolutely and was that a highlight for you as well i think so yeah mm -hmm. and i'm definitely looking towards um forward to next year because we should get those generation three cameras the six and the sevens you mm -hmm. know in our hands and uh, a lot of people in each other are waiting for those uh, what are you look looking forward to personally next year oh well a bit like you just mentioned what's coming next year mm. from, um, from nick on the continuing um development of the the Z mirrorless mm -hmm. uh, range, um, and um, you know, continuing to um, work with Nikon Owner Magazine, which um, you know I enjoy doing greatly as as the editor and uh, seeing what comes up. I think one of the highlights for me was um, when Gillian started doing this women in photography, mm. highlighting people like you know the wonderful Annie Carhill, who is. A, a wonderful photographer in her own right and married to our good friend joe mcnally mm -hmm. um and you know um next year um we're looking forward to featuring seth miranda um after uh after yeah meeting for him. halloween edition <laughs> <laughs> the red edition yes yeah. absolutely so um yes i uh, same for you for you for next year too? i think so yeah, yeah. i'm excited i uh, mm. have to you know keep the fort you know keep the show going that's right you know uh becky is gonna be here as well every now and then so yes. she's not disappearing so um she'll help us with podcast so we will yes. still continue to do that yes. hopefully we can get you on live stream hopefully i can get you on the live streams more often as well well i'll do my uh, i'll do my i'll do my best and um you know i've had a couple of um uh, contacts from becky in the last couple of days so she's um, over in america now with the family and enjoying herself and having a well-deserved break so uh, we wish her well yeah 
Definitely. And uh, we will record the last podcast and you can report next week. So that's still coming out. We will have a lot of content coming out um, throughout the Christmas period. So we're going to have a Nikon 2023 video. We're going to have predictions probably in the first days of New Year, uh, the podcast next week, and just a couple of out and about videos. So we're going to plan that for you. Yeah. And and also, if you have any ideas that uh, you'd like us to try, you know, this is uh, this is your channel, really. So uh, we'd welcome any any sort of um, bright ideas that that you might have, and um, um, so feel free to communicate. Absolutely, from all of us at Grace Overs Minster, all this stuff, everyone, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all the festive whatever holidays you have, Happy Holidays, and we definitely would love to see you again next year. Yes, absolutely. Be good to one another. Have a wonderful Christmas. Happy New Year. Bye-bye.